Welcome to Clan Vyrepold Gwyn Gill, Go Gary Queen Drobe Ol, Len Decilio Go Go Gach. That is Welsh for one heck of a tongue twister. Welcome to Wales. You know how when you're a kid and all you ask is why, why, why? Well, I never quite outgrew that whole quest for knowledge phase. In fact, I've made a career out of asking who, what, where, why, and how as an arts and travel reporter for the past 20 years. So, if I have an insatiable curiosity about the exciting, inspiring, beautiful world of art, architecture, and hidden history all around us, I bet you do too. This isn't your typical what to do on a vacation travel show, oh no. This is your all-access pass to a deeper understanding of the world's great art and architecture, people and places, history, and how did they do that. So, come along on our educational journey, our field trip for grown-ups who have never quite grown up, and learn with Curious Traveler. Curious Traveler is made possible by... Oceana Cruises. We explore the majestic Mediterranean, ancient empires, artistic discoveries, worldwide cuisine. Your world awaits your discovery. Oceana Cruises. Your world, your way. Oceanacruises.com. Pocket Protein. Liquid protein on the go. Designed for travel. Pocketprotein.com. Anatomy, European traveling clothing for women. Your adventure, your style. Anatomy.com. Wales is a land full of legends, history, beauty, and culture. It's enough to make you say, Duin Kerry Cumri. That means I love Wales, and you will too. So, Wales is its own sovereign nation, of course, but it's also kind of a country within a country, separate from England, but was once a territory of England, which are both part of Great Britain, and so is Scotland, but not everyone's British. The Scots are Scottish, the Irish are Irish, although only Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, but the Republic of Ireland in the South shares a Celtic language with the Welsh, but not with the English. English is a Germanic language, but no one here in the British Isles is German. Everyone uses the same Latin alphabet, well, sort of. I'm so confused. At least everyone drinks tea over here, right? Hello. Here's what I'm curious about in Wales. Why are there more castles per square mile here than anywhere else on Earth? Why is there a Prince of Wales but a Queen of England? Why is there a dragon on the Welsh flag? Why do the Welsh speak a Brythonic language when their neighbors speak English? And where the heck is Cymru? From the smallest church in all of Britain to the longest place name in all of Britain, time to get curious about Wales. So, Wales was first Celtic, then Roman, then Saxon, even a few Vikings settled here. Then Wales was a bunch of little kingdoms, and the best way to learn about Welsh history is through its castles. In 1283, King Edward I ordered the building of castles in Wales. And today, Wales boasts more castles per square mile than anywhere else in the world. With more than 600 castles to go around, you'd think somebody'd offer me one so I could be the princess. I only want one. But alas, that offer has yet to be delivered by my knight in shining armor. So, in the meantime, let's get curious about Wales' iron ring of castles. In the late 13th century, England's King Edward I, nicknamed Longshanks because of his long legs, felt it was his divine duty to conquer Wales and make it a part of Britain. You know how those medieval kings can be. He built his legendary Iron Ring of Wales, a series of castles each a day's march apart, including Harlech, Gomaris, and Carnarvon, his grandest. Here's what I'm curious about at Carnarvon Castle. What are the walls of Constantinople doing in the middle of Wales? Why was Prince Charles crowned here? And why does England have a Prince of Wales at all? Today, Carnarvon Castle is a World Heritage Site and, in medieval times, was King Edward's main headquarters, the crown jewel in his iron ring, so to speak. In 1301, King Edward I invested his son, Edward II, as the first Prince of Wales. To the English, this was seen as England's loyalty to Wales, but to the Welsh, this was seen as a ruthless conquest. Think I'm kidding? Even when the most recent Prince of Wales, number 21, had his investiture here, His Royal Highness Prince Charles, of course, there were still Welsh people protesting yeah, yeah, yeah. outside the castle. And that was in 1969. So, that centuries-old English-Welsh feud is alive and well today. And Carnarvon Castle is a powerful symbol of who was really in charge around here. 
The design of Carnarvon Castle is completely different than the other Edwardian castles here in Wales. As you'll see, it has these polygonal shapes and these striped stonework with different colors. Time for our why is that there moment. Well, it is modeled after the walls of Constantinople back in the Byzantine Roman Empire. Why? Well, apparently, King Edward believed he was fulfilling the dream of Roman Emperor Magnus Maximus by building this castle. All I have to say is, if he was doing that, well, King Edward had one Magnus Maximus ego. This is the Welsh legend of Braithuid Maxen Wiledig, or the Dream of Emperor Maximus, which tells how Roman Emperor Maximus marries a British woman, which then transfers the authority of the Roman Empire to the British Empire. So Maximus is considered the founding father of the Welsh royal dynasties. Ah. So, just as Roman emperors ruled over the Roman Empire, Edward was making the statement that he was now the emperor over the British Empire, which of course included Wales. And that explains the odd design of his Carnarvon Castle. That's fascinating. So you have a, a sort of a Byzantine design right here in the middle of Wales. That's right. And Edward, I think, was trying to establish a new ca capital here on the western side of the Roman Empire, while there was a eastern capital down in Turkey. So, from the opposite ends of the Roman Empire, the walls of Constantinople to the east and Carnarvon Castle to the west, west uniting with the east. You can see the similarities, those stripes and polygonal shapes in both. And there's another Roman Empire connection to Carnarvon. It sits atop the Roman settlement of Sagontium. Sagontium? Mm -hmm. The Roman settlement of Sagontium was established in around 78 AD. Um, Edward I, in 1283, uh, was very keen to present himself as a warrior king or a Caesar and to ally himself with Constantine the Great. And there's even more Sagantium connections here. We're really enjoying uh, picking up uh, Welsh words and learning about um, Welsh name origins as we go along. Carnarvon, what does that actually mean? Carnarvon is Welsh for the fort in Arbon, uh, which is the region of North Wales here, overlooking Anglesey. And the fort actually refers to the Roman fort of Segontium. It all ties in together. I <laughs> knew it. I knew I was on to something. On to our next Iron Ring Castle, also a World Heritage Site. This one with a more traditional round shape and a fancy French influence. Uh -huh. Built between 1283 and 1289, Harlot Castle was modeled after the majestic castles of the historic Savoy Kingdom. Savoy is actually where modern day France and Switzerland are today, and you know the French and the Swiss have the best design sense. Only the top master masons were selected to build Harlot Castle, and today you can see how it rises majestically directly out of the rock. So today we get to stand hundreds of feet above the Irish Sea with the best views. Location, location, location. There's a very important master mason that was hand-selected to design this. Absolutely, yeah. Well, back in the 13th century, it was an extreme privilege for whoever had the role of designing Edward's castles. And Edward handpicked Master James of St George, brought him all the way over from Savoy, and he began to employ some of his practices here on the castles in Wales as well. And there's differences in the designs of King Edward's castles for good reason. So here the towers are a perfect circle because they can absorb the most impact from artillery coming in. Because um, here we're, it was at the greatest risk of a Welsh attack. Over at castles like Carnarvon with the polygon edged angles, um, that was his imperial statement. That was the centre of government for Edward here in Wales and he really wanted to focus on more of an um, artistic design really. So here it was more all about the military aspect. And part of that military might was shown in Harlech's terrific height. And if you're off, you know, in the sea looking up, it looks as if the castle is rising out of uh, the dome. Absolutely, yeah. And that was, that, was that the intention, to make it look like it was part of the rock that we're standing on? Absolutely. On? With all of Edward's castles, he hand chose the spot for each and every one of them. Um, and yeah, obviously with the impressive range of Snowdonia and the sea, that's what's captured all the imaginations of artists and poets throughout the century since. Harlech withstood the longest siege in British history from 1461 to 1468 during the War of the Roses, which had something to do with why all these little holes are everywhere. Time for our why is that there moment. And it's the first time we've seen here in the UK um, put lug holes going up in spirals around the towers here. And um, it meant that the scaffolding could go all the way around, which is obviously why 
explains the height that we've got here at Harlech. And in addition to fighting wars and all that stuff, King Edward had private royal apartments in each of his castles, and his Harlech royal apartment was complete with another very important engineering marvel. I'm interested in an area called the uh, garderobe. The garderobe, the most important part of the castle, yeah. What is that? Um, so the garderobe was the toilet in the medieval period, um, and Master James St. George, again, thought it was very important that he designed a tower exclusively for, um, as a toilet, essentially, designing a ditch to carry away everything from it, and if you want privacy, forget it, everyone went in at once. So at that time, though, that was sort of advanced plumbing, even though it doesn't seem so advanced to us today? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, yeah, pretty much one of the first forms of plumbing, yeah, here in the British Isles, yeah. Oh, that's funny. When he wasn't building La Toilette Royale, Master James of St. George was busy designing our next castle and also a World Heritage Site. And some say it's the fairest of them all. Beaumaris Castle was the last and the largest built by King Edward I as part of his iron ring to keep those Welsh in line. It was begun in 1295 and was never finished. It has perfect symmetry and some people think it looks like a spaceship. All I know is that the name Beau means beautiful and Morris means marsh and I just think it's beautiful overall. Saving the best for last, you might even say Beau Morris was King Edward's piece de résistance. It's perhaps the most impressive example of a concentric castle in the world, a castle within a castle for added protection. Because Beaumaris was built on that flat, marshy land, Master James didn't have the same challenges as building atop an uneven, rocky cliff like at Harlech, so it was a little easier to experiment with the size and shape he wanted. But do you notice something interesting here? It looks a little short to withstand attack, right? Time for our why is that there moment. Well, that's because Beaumaris is forever unfinished. The towers were meant to be twice as high. Why? Well, after a lifetime of conquests for King Edward and a lifetime of building those castles that helped said conquests, our lads King Longshanks and Master James of St. George both died before Beaumaris was finished. And here's another curiosity. As safe and sturdy as Beaumaris Castle was, it was never attacked, maybe because everyone thought it was too pretty. And today, Beaumaris is a wonderful place to visit and to wander around the quaint village that grew up around it. You will see one of the oldest houses in Great Britain, or you can pop into the local ice cream shop. Yes, in the middle of winter, I swear the Welsh don't feel the cold. And there, you can start working on your Welsh. There's that word again. We'll get back to it later. First, some Welsh churches to explore. Let's begin this set of curious questions with, what is Eliseg's pillar? Hmm? Remember that Magnus Maximus story back at Carnarvon Castle? The legend of the Roman Empire carried on through the Welsh royal bloodline. Well, the inscriptions on Eliseg's pillar tells the genealogy of those Welsh kings, including King Eliseg and King Vortigern, who has a tie to the legendary King Arthur, but more on that later. Aww. For now, Eliseg's pillar is important because it was once a very important holy cross and gave the name to its surrounding valley and church. Vale Crucis simply means Valley of the Cross. And Vale Crucis Abbey is a magnificently preserved example of ancient Gothic architecture, with that wonderful rose window and ornamental pointed arch gateway with those three lancet-shaped arches. Above the window is a faint inscription that says, The Abbot Adam did his work. May he rest in happy peace. Amen. So who were the Cistercian monks? Well, the name Cistercian comes from the French name for the village of Citeaux, where the order started. It's near Dijon, France, which is where the mustard started, but I digress. The Cistercians here at Vale Crucis Abbey lived a life of poverty and detachment to emulate the life of the original apostles. When they weren't in prayer, they were often copying texts, as monks were some of the few that could read or write during the Middle Ages. The Cistercians, in fact, were known for their appreciation of the literary arts. They also had their own fish pond and grew their own food. They may have even brewed beer since safe drinking water was hard to find. But what I'm curious about is, why is this beautiful, peaceful abbey in such bad shape? Well, it suffered several fires, and later that old King Edward was to blame again. Owen Glendall's men came along and they 
set it on fire and, and then also uh, King Edward's men because they thought that the abbot was in cahoots with the English and also vice versa, King Edward thought the abbot was in cahoots with the Welsh. So poor Vale Crucis Abbey was literally caught in the crossfires. Then, three centuries later, in the late 1530s, King Henry VIII ordered the dissolution of the monasteries, which basically took the wealth from the monasteries and gave it to the monarch. <coughs> vale Crucis Abbey was dissolved by royal decree in 1537, but before all that, this was a rather peaceful place to live. When things were peaceful, what was the daily life like for the monks here? So it would have been a, a lot of time spent in quiet contemplation, a lot of time praying, and it was even from the dormitory above, there was um, some what's called night stairs that led directly into where the church is. So they'd have to pray like, right through the middle of the night at any time of night. But be careful on these night stairs. Maybe bring your candles. These spiral stairs are tricky. Ow. But of course, with that monastic vow of silence, the monks couldn't even say ow unless they were in one particular room. This particular room yep. is something special. What could the monks do in this room? So this here? was the only place that the monks were allowed to talk amongst themselves. The rest of the time they'd be in silent contemplation or praying. So they would go in here, maybe gossip about and, each other and be like, oh, yeah. brother John's making me crazy and this guy this, this and that. If walls could talk, right? Yes, 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 definitely. <laughs> but let's not end on a disrespectful note because Vale Crucis Abbey is a testament to the order of a group of people who believed that the true path to God was through quiet contemplation in a serene, heavenly setting. Most people still um, find it quite almost like a spiritual um, and feel uh, at peace when they come here. From a Cistercian Abbey to a Celtic church, time for a little, and we do mean little, pit stop. The 5th through the 7th centuries was the age of the Celtic saints. Though much of East Britain was settled by pagan Saxons, the Celtic church survived here in the West, with Saints Diffrig, Saint Padarn, and Saint David. Phew, at least I can say that one. And this was also when the Welsh word clan first appeared, meaning church settlement. One of those surviving clans is the tiny town of Rose-on-Sea, in an equally tiny little stone building sandwiched between the highway and a bike path along the waterfront. If you blink, you just might miss it. Time for our why is that there moment. This is St. Trillo's Chapel here at Rose-on-Sea. It was built in the 6th century. Check out all these stones here. You can just tell how old it is. Now, here's what's cool about this. This is not only one of the first Celtic chapels built in the area, it is also, as I'm echoing here, the smallest church in all of Britain. Look, I can barely get through the doorway. Watch your step, though. There's plenty of room for a congregation of six. And of course, it was built right over a fresh water spring in case you feel like doing a mm, midday baptism. You never know. Here's what's even more curious. Despite its odd little location, this smallest church in all of Britain is still open for services every Sunday. And that Celtic clan, which is spelled L-L-A-N, by the way, leads us perfectly into our Welsh lesson. So here's what I'm curious about with the Welsh language. Mm? On one small island of Great Britain, how has this ancient language survived? Why is there such a high concentration of Welsh speakers here in the clan peninsula, but then just a hundred miles away in England, no one can speak a lick of Welsh? Well, we are taking our curious questions to the Welsh linguists at... Nen Gwythern. Mm -hmm. Is that close? Gwythern, yeah, very good, yeah. Uh, you obviously celebrate the Welsh language. That's right. Um, do you kind of tell me a little bit about the origin of the Welsh language? The Roman Empire. Before that, it was the Celtic Empire, and it spread far further than the Roman Empire did. It went all over the place. Then the Romans came and started pushing the Celts apart, and so they were going further and further west. At the 5th century, everyone spoke Brythonic, in, the, in Britain, which was Brythonic. the line Brythonic, okay. yeah. And then as the Saxons came in, they pushed people to Scotland, to Wales, to Cornwall, different places. So it's a completely different language. Only about 600,000 people in the world still speak Welsh, and most of them are right here around Nant Gwythern. That's why you'll see the name of Wales displayed as Cymru, and why you'll see all the road signs with Welsh first, English second. 86% speak Welsh as a first language. Wow. 
Is, is there anybody in this area that maybe uh, would speak only Welsh and know English, or is that, that um, not English? Young children, and what you find is with old people, sometimes they forget, they forget the second language. Yeah, well, it's good if they forget the English and they, yeah. they keep the Welsh, <laughs> yeah, so you know, you have exactly, to pick one. Yeah. And all the children here are raised to be bilingual. Almost all schools be Welsh main language. And children are like sponges. They don't need to learn languages. After a couple of weeks, they're speaking the language fluently. Let's see if I can sponge up Welsh as easily. Yeah, right. Borada. That's it. Samai. Samai. That's how are things? You okay? Samai. What's up? What's up? Yeah, Samai. What's up? What's up? Yeah, Samai. What's up? Okay, here's all you need to know about speaking Welsh. While it uses the Latin or English alphabet, none of the letters actually sound like they look. The W sounds like U, while the U is pronounced as E, and then there's the double letters. That's right, there are double letters in the Welsh alphabet. Of course there is. DD is uh, th, LL is cl, like clearing your throat. Not to be confused with ch, which is more like a cat hissing than a human clearing its throat, I think. I think the really important one you've got to learn is dioch. Dioch. Which means. Okay. That's it, right down in your throat here. Deal. Something in your throat. Deal. Thank you. Deal. Now, for extra credit points. We teach this one, we usually do it with jazz hands. Oh, good! Okay, okay, okay. okay jazz okay. hands, okay. We're not afraid, we like jazz okay. hands. Okay. okay, right. Because the accent goes on the ged here. Okay. So you, we do the jazz hands when we do the ged. Okay. So it goes bendy gedig. Bendy gedig. That's it. Oh, this is fantastic. My first Welsh sentence. Llandidno is bendy gedig. So when I meet anybody and I do this, they're going to know I'm truly Welsh. Well, or well, a really bad tourist. They'll know that you've learned Welsh from that good thing. It's bendy gedig. <laughs> I messed it up already, didn't I? Okay, before we leave beautiful Nantgwythern, there's another wonderful Welsh curiosity here. Nantgwythern actually means stream of Vortigern. Remember that Welsh king, King Vortigern, descended from Magnus Maximus in the legend? So this beautiful stream of Vortigern all has something to do with that dragon on the Welsh flag, and King Arthur and Merlin. Bear with me here. So why is there a Thregoch, or red dragon, on the Welsh flag? Time for our why is that there moment. Huh? I'm going to just throw it out there. Does it have anything to do with King Arthur and Merlin? In a way, yes. Good, good, yes. good, good. Uh, uh, King Vortigern, okay. who's chased through Britain by the Saxons into Wales. Vortigern makes a last stand and uh, he tries to build a castle and it falls down. And uh, they send for a young boy uh, because the advisors say that he has to be a human sacrifice. But not to fear, according to legend, that boy was the legendary King Arthur's main wizard, Merlin. And being the smart wizard that he was, he saves his own life with the following story. He convinces the king that he's building on uh, ground where there's a problem. And if he empties the lake, he will find the answer at the bottom of the lake. Okay. And what is at the bottom of the lake? Is there's there a, a dragon huge, there? Or there's whatever? a huge stone chest. Okay. Two dragons are locked inside. A white one, which represents the Saxon force, okay. that's chased Vortigern, and the red dragon represents the Celtic spirit. And I'm just going to guess the Celtic red dragon won. The red dragon did win. So that explains why the red dragon is forever the symbol of Wales and on the Welsh flag. Yeah, he flies around the skies today, this white puffy cloud we get. He's still alive, Excellent. very much. I love this part. Those puffy clouds you see in the mountains, well, here in Wales, that is called dragon's breath. So now when you see the smoke billowing from those beautiful Snowdonian mountains, you'll know why. For our final stop, now that my Welsh is perfected, I am ready to take on that famous Welsh tongue twister. Mm -hmm. This picturesque church behind me is called St. Mary's in the Hollow of the White Hazel, or in Welsh, Landfair Pwyl Gwyngil. You're kind of impressed that I knew that, right? Well, here is what is even more interesting. While this was built during medieval times, much later in the 1860s, somebody got a really brilliant tourism idea. They decided to extend the name of the town to Lanvirepool Gwyngil Go Ger U Quirndrob Ul Lendis Ilio Go Go Gach. In fact, that holds the world record for the longest name of a town in all of the United Kingdom. Now, speaking of world records, don't I get something for my wonderful Welsh?
Okay, ready to tie all of our whale's curiosities together? Well, the Len in Len Fire Pull whatever means church, which we learned at the smallest church in Britain. But it's really pronounced Clan, which we learned at Nantgwetheren, which really means stream of Vortigern, as in King Vortigern, the legendary king responsible for the dragon on the Welsh flag, and is also descended from Roman Emperor Magnus Maximus, whom King Longshanks emulated by building his Iron Ring of Castles and whose royal lineage is inscribed on Eliseg's pillar, which gave the name to Vale Crucis Abbey, whose church was ultimately destroyed by that very same King Longshanks, whose son was the first Prince of Wales, who was related to the current Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, whose son, Prince William, and wife Kate lived in Wales for a time, by the way, who may or may not have ever taken the train to Clanfire Pulled Gwyngill, la 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 la, go go gach. Phew! We hope you enjoyed this educational journey through Wales, and maybe now you're even more curious about its fine traditions, grand history, wonderful people, culture, and sometimes tricky language. So, as the Welsh say, yakida. Llanfai, pwll gwyn gyll, bwger a chwyrn, robo llan, ti silio go go go. Llanfai, pwll gwyn gyll, bwger a chwyrn, robo llan, ti silio. Curious Travelers made possible by... Oceana Cruises. We explore the majestic Mediterranean, ancient empires, artistic discoveries, worldwide cuisine. Your world awaits your discovery. Oceana Cruises. Your world, your way. Oceanacruises.com. Pocket Protein. Liquid protein on the go. Designed for travel. Pocketprotein.com. Anatomy. European traveling clothing for women. Your adventure, your style. Anatomy.com. Still curious? Go to CuriousTravelerTV.com and follow us on Twitter and Facebook.